I'm going to talk tonight about Alfred Russell Wallace in Sarawak. Um, Wallace is obviously a name to conjure with. Everybody will be aware of him. After his four years in South America and a singularly disastrous hassle trying to bring his specimens back from there, which I'm sure some of you may be aware of, Wallace decided to mount his next venture in professional collecting in the, as he called it, the Malay Archipelago, Southeast Asia. And he traveled out there in the spring of 1854 and would spend the next eight years um, in the Malay Archipelago, acting on the one hand very much as a professional collector. He needed to earn money, so he was collecting specimens for sale, shipping them back to his agent Stevens in London. But he was also a most interested scientist, and he wanted to collect material for himself also that he could then work up subsequently when he came back to Britain. When he went out there, he was alone except for one assistance, assistant, a boy named Charles Allen, who Wallace seemed to think was 16, but in fact was only 14 years old when he went out to accompany Wallace. Now, I first began to get interest in Wallace's Sarawak collections back in the early 2000s when Lord Cranbrook invited me to participate in a paper he was writing on the vertebrate collections made by Wallace in Sarawak for a conference that he was attending. This was a, a very interesting experience. And about, the paper was published in 2005, and about less, just under 10 years later, I picked up on Wallace again when, with Nigel Collar, we wrote a, a, a review of Wallace for Birding Asia to celebrate the centenary of his death. His death was in um, 1913. We wrote it for 2013. And just recently, I've been coming back to Wallace again because I always felt there was more to his vertebrate collections, more detail in his bird collections than we'd been able to expound on in my previous um, uh, cooperation with Lord Cranbrook. And I should say, for everything I talk about here, uh, I'm most indebted to Lord Cranbrook, and he has played a significant role in it. Um, what really triggered me to get back interested in this was that just recently, I was writing a paper on Alan Octavian Hume and his development as an ornithologist um, in a tower in India. And this was based on a combination of an analysis of his specimen material with a few of the very few remaining diaries of Hume, which happened to be owned by the Natural History Museum. And I find this integration of specimens with the writings of a person can throw new light on how they came about understanding the, the um, bird fauna that they were studying and how their own knowledge of it developed. Um, so in the case of Hume, I was using his diaries and his specimens. Now in the case of um, uh, Wallace, he has his bird specimens on the one hand, which the Natural History Museum has, uh, most of them. And he also has his so-called species registries, where for each country and for each animal group, he used to list the specimens that he'd collected by supposed species, as he thought, out in the field. So, from Wallace went out to uh, Malay Archipelago in the spring of 1854, the, fir the first place he spent a really extended period, and in the longest period he spent anywhere while out in the Malay Archipelago, was his visit to Sarawak, which was from uh, November 1854, the beginning of November, to the January 1856, a period of about 15 months he spent in all in uh, Sarawak. And where he was based was very much in the western extremity of what is now the state of Mal uh, Sarawak in Malaysia, in the area that was run by the so-called Raja James Brooke, 
who was in control of that area um, at the time and who was very sympathetic to natural history studies. While Wallace was there, he was, as I say, he only had a very young and inexperienced assistant with, assistant with him. It was very important for him to generate money. And the main focus of his work when he was in Sarawak was on insects. In fact, in the course of about 15 months, he seems to have collected uh, nearly 25,000 insects, which is a, a pretty astonishing uh, a number. And if anything, his second focus turned out to be on orangutans, about which very little was then known, and to knowledge of which he added extensively. So although he himself was very interested in birds, birds figured somewhat lower down his list of interests in Sarawak, and not least, uh, as he mentioned himself afterwards, this was because his assistant, Charles Allen, um, did begin to become quite good at shooting birds, but never became much good at all at preparing birds. And preparing birds in the tropical climate takes a fair amount of time and effort. And clearly, Wallace was quite uh, short of um, time and to, in which to put in the effort. Uh, so when Wallace went out to Sarawak, what was already known about the birds of the place? Well, the, the answer to this is basically very little. The first book which had contained at least an attempted species list was by Hugh Lowe, who had gone out to, um, in the 1840s, to um, Sarawak as, as, as an administrator, but he had also gone out. He was very, very interested in botany and wanted to collect plants and seeds. But he was also a more general natural historian. He had an interest more widely. And when he came back and wrote up this book, he consulted the uh, curators in the British Museum in order to put together a species list of Sarawak birds which came in at just under 60 known species from Sarawak. So you can see that there was a limited knowledge at the time of Sarawak birds. So this was the basis that Wallace was building on. Now, when Wallace went out, of course, he had considerable experience of working on birds in South America, but he had no first-hand knowledge of the birds of East Asia at all. And the only reference work on birds that he took with him was volume one of Bonaparte's Conspectus Generum Avium, which was the recently published go-to world list of birds. Um, however, it's important to note that he took volume one with him. Volume two, which covered many of the larger non-passerines, such as ducks and pigeons and birds of prey and things, had not been published and would not be published till 1857. So the sum total of what Wallace had as reference material with him was this conspectus. And um, much later, when he was writing his autobiography, Wallace looked back on his time in the Malay archipelago and said, during my whole eight years collecting in the East, I could almost always identify every bird described, and if I could not do so, was pretty sure it was a new or an undescribed species. Now, how much was this the um, slightly enhanced recollections of older age, and how much was this actually true? I hope my talk will in some degree address this issue. In trying to understand what was in the conspectus, you will find you must dismiss all ideas of a modern field guide to birds. This was written entirely in Latin. It was, gives the bird's name, and it tells you um, just a very few details indeed about where it had previously been described, and um, possibly of, of where it is known to have occurred, and that information is often incorrect, and very occasionally a few extra details. Now, Wallace was obviously aware that this was perhaps not an ideal guide for field identification, 
And he took the trouble before he went out to Sarawak to uh, pay a number of visits to the British Museum and to annotate his copy of the conspectus considerably from, as we have already seen, the relatively few relevant species from Sarawak that were then known. So he did do what he could to give himself a background for when he went out there. When he was out in Sarawak, what he did was to form a list um, in his so-called species registry of the birds he collected, in which he listed each of the supposed new species that he was encountering. When I say new, new for that trip, not necessarily new to Sarawak, some may already have been known. And he would make a short note there, and it would be a numbered list. And in total, this amounted, for the period he was in Sarawak, to a total of 98 numbers. In fact, this only refers to 96 species, because for reasons best known to him, possibly being hassled out in the field, he managed to jump over two numbers so they, nothing exists for them at all. But this was the basic, this was the one of the two ways that he was recording his specimen information. In his field notebook, um, a species registry, um, and the other way was on, of course, on his specimen labels. Now, he's, oh, I should say before, before I go on, in this you may notice that he does try, at the beginning at least, to use Latin names. Um, and if you look up at, say, the first three, he's got Latin names there, sometimes with question mark, but he's also got a reference to BP is Bonaparte, and 397 or 296 or whatever is a reference to the page. So he's linking the, what he's writing there, the name he is writing there, to the reference work that he has with him. So he's, he's demonstrating, initially at least. He very soon, as you will see, just going down the first page, gets slightly fed up doing this and doesn't bother most of the time. And in fact, after the first page and a half or so, he entirely gives up putting in the page number, although he is still clearly using Bonaparte to apply names where he can apply names. Also, do note that in some cases, he's not really making very much headway in identifying the birds out in the field anyway. Like, if you look at number nine, warbler question mark. I will come back to that later. Now, and it, indeed, by the end of his time in Sarawak, in the last three months, he was doing a big trip up one river, uh, across the, the watershed, and down another river, the River Sarawak, back to um, uh, the, his main base. And he, at this point, um, you can see he pretty much gave up trying to do any detailed identification in the field at all. It not helped by the fact that many of the birds he was now collecting were non-passerines, and of course, the one re reference volume he had was of no help in identifying them anyway. So, uh, yes, he got more and more um, behind, as it were, and you can see this again in the fact that as you go through his specimens and check them against the labels on his, the specimens he took, his, his registry, up to about 23, you get specimens from 1854. Then up to about 85, they're all from 1885, 1855. And the final lot, there's a mixture of 1855 and 1856. And he obviously, I think, possibly got a bit confused. He assembled a number and then tried writing them in and got a little bit confused. So that's how he was going about it with his species registry. Now, of the specimens he collected, we have a, hundred, a whole lot of his specimens. He very kindly, in 1873, presented his collection, his entire collection of Malaysian birds that he had kept for himself, and I stress the ones that he collected for himself, to uh, the British Museum. And in the case of Sarawak specimens, this comprised 103 specimens, which cover 85 of the 96 numbers represented in his species registry. Many of his other specimens had been sold on his behalf by Stevens, his agent. 
He had sent them back at the end of his period in Sarawak at the beginning of January 1856. And he had sent them back to Stevens, clearly indicating, I want these saved for me. And in Sarawak, it was the majority of specimens he wanted saved for him for later study. But he had instructed Stevens to sell just over 60 specimens on his behalf, which Stevens did quite promptly. And some of them went to other collectors, Lord Tweedale in particular, and ended up coming to the British Museum anyway because the, those other collectors presented their collection to the British Museum. So came to the NHM indirectly via other collectors. There were 27 specimens representing 19 species registry entries, but four additional ones. So we've now up to 89 of the, um, 90, uh, of the 96. And then finally, tracking, there are some Wallace specimens I've found in other museums, so I haven't really done a big systematic look. There's about six listed there, two extra um, uh, species registry entries represented. So in total, we've got about 136 sp specimens to play with, representing 91 out of the 1996 species registry entries. Um, and although that's not um, uh, a, a complete total, based on what Wallace wrote to Stevens, there are probably no more than about 30 Tharawak specimens that haven't been accounted for in this, which may be out there somewhere, having been sold by Stevens, but we don't know where. And I just thought I'd stick in here, about the time we got onto a bird, um, <laughs> this picture of a, a red-throated bee-eater, which is one of the species that is not represented in the Natural History Museum collection. And this one was sold by um, Stevens and it went to John Gould, and when he in turn passed it to the Museum's Victoria in Australia. So this is a specimen that's now out in Australia. And it's interesting because, as I say, it is one of the ones um, that the NHM doesn't have a specimen of. And you can see Wallace's label lying face up on the cross the, uh, the belly of the bird. And you might just see at the bottom um, uh, right-hand corner the number 11. That links to the number in the species registry. Now, this links how many specimens do we know that Wallace collected with the, number, the, the different species registry entries. And you can see for most species, or Wallace-defined species, he only had a single specimen. For um, about 20 of the, uh, the species, he had two specimens. And then a couple for which he had three, five, or seven. So in other words, he didn't have more than two specimens for more than 95% of the species that he collected in Sarawak. Now this is a slight underestimate because obviously 30 specimens we haven't accounted for. But you can see very much what he was focusing on doing with birds was not collecting like he was with insects in bulk to sale, but very largely collecting in a very focused manner. The birds were time-consuming to prepare, and many of the sp specimens he collected, he was saving for himself rather than selling to raise money. So he couldn't afford to spend too much time making too many bird specimens. Right, now let's start off with a, a bird from the Sarawak collection. And this is a typical Wallace label. He's, pre he's prepared by getting printed, collected by A.R. Wallace, 185 before he went to the Malay Archipelago. And then he can just put in the year in question. The, so it says 1854. It's one of the early ones in Sarawak. He's put in the name that he has got from Bonaparte's conspectus. He's put in Sarawak. He never said anything more detailed than Sarawak. All the specimens are from Sarawak. So he didn't try and give detailed localities, much in the way that, for example, Darwin didn't when he was in the Galapagos. The sex and the number seven links to the number in his species registry. And if you look at that, look at seven here, you will see there the same species, Megalima trimaculata, linked to the Bonaparte page. And it's written in exactly the same way there, because he did both these things in the field. He 
wrote the species name, which he had derived from Bonaparte in his notebook. He also wrote it on the specimen label. Now, we go to another barbet, Megalima. If you look at number 19 here, you'll see there is a specimen that he hasn't given a species name for. He's just given a genus. He presumably couldn't work out in the field exactly what species it was, so he just labelled it generically in his notebook. And when you go to the relevant bird specimen here, you will see that it is labelled in exactly the same way, just with the genus. Now, this happens to be, and this is going to be very important in this talk, the difference for what you can deduce by comparing the specimens that Stephen sold on behalf of Wallace to the specimens he kept himself and studied later. The ones that he shipped back in January 1856 to uh, Stevens were rapidly sold by Stevens. He never had the chance himself to look at them again. So whatever was written on the label was written out by him out in Sarawak. This was one such, and not surprisingly, what's on the label matches what's in his notebook. He couldn't work out what the species was. However, when you go to another specimen, that was retained, of the same species that was retained by Wallace. I'm afraid the label's not quite so obvious, but you will see that here he has actually written in the species name. It's clearly written in the same hand by Wallace, but in a slightly different pen. This must have been done later, after he came back to Britain, when he had other reference works to consult. And in fact, you can demonstrate this because on the back of this label, probably even harder for you to read, same label, there's a little reference there, which actually is an abbreviation for Planche Colore, which is the work produced by Temic, and he actually gives the reference to the page from which he has identified this specimen. So this is an example of a species that he was well aware it was a barbet, but he couldn't give a precise identification in the field, as you can see from the specimen he'd sent back to Stevens. But then later, he worked it up and could add to his label. Sometimes, he struggled rather more than with uh, his barbets. If you look at, um, I think it's number um, 32, is it? Sorry, difficult to read. Yes, 32 down here. I don't know if you can read that. But all it says there is flycatcher small. Um, and he has a bit of a description. And this was the best that he could do out in the field for what is now known as the grey-headed canary flycatcher. And when you look at a specimen that was sold, he sent back and was sold on his behalf by Stevens, you will see that it's got no identification on it at all. He could not identify that specimen himself in the field. He just knew that it appeared to be a flycatcher of some sorts. Flycatchers are not that straightforward to identify. However, when you look at um, his own specimen, you will see there's a full identification which is correct the name is correct for the time. But what you will also notice, if you look closely at this label, do you notice now, instead of being a, what, an 1850 something label, it's an overwritten 1860 label. He's put 55. What he's done is he's decided, rather than muck up my old label by writing something further on it, I'll take that old one off and stick a new label on. And, but of course, when he was back in Britain, this was not until 1862, all he had left were the 1860 labels. So he's used an 1860 label. So you can see he must have done this and worked this specimen up after he was back in Britain in the 1860s. If you think that um, 
flycatchers are complicated, and I certainly do at times, um, bulbuls can be absolutely nightmarish. Especially when you're out in somewhere like Sarawak. In fact, Wallace ended up collecting more bulbul species, about 10, and that's only a subset of the ones that total occur in Sarawak, than any other um, type of bird. And he clearly um, struggled with their identification, as one would. And what these next, this slide and the next one do is illustrate another problem that arose not all his uh, nominal species in his species notebook are actually good separate species. This bird here, he has, um, when he was out in the field, he was calling it merely Iole. The Olivacea has been added in subsequently. Um, and you'll see it's number 59 here. And if you look at the next slide, you will see another specimen of exactly the same species. Also, he could only identify generically out in the field, but it's actually got species registry number 61 on it. In this particular case, he made an assumption that there were two separate species. Now, checking the notes he wrote in his species registry for each, the only difference in the description is that one he claimed had a pale iris and one he claimed had a dark iris. Now, this could well be to do with something like age, but clearly, maybe actually he was just being cautious. He thought, this could be two separate species. I'll give them separate numbers to make myself think about them and look into it more closely when I get back. So here is a situation in which, to my mind, very much not surprisingly, Wallace really struggled and didn't realize that two birds that were from the same species, uh, were, he actually thought they might be from different ones. Perhaps more surprisingly, we find the same with this um, greater racket-tailed drongos he collected. Here, you'll see this one with these very nice tail feathers, is from his species registry, it's number 34. However, he also collected this one, which happens not to have the long tail feathers, and he's given it a separate species registry number. This is number 50. Now, again, to be fair to Wallace, he was maybe just being cautious. In his notes, he recognizes that this bird, as he says, is essentially identical to 34, except it has and he, as he said, even tail feathers. Well, they're both actually pretty even. What he obviously means is much shorter tail feathers. So again, he couldn't tell for sure that these belong to the same species. In the field, he merely gave them that both of them, the generic name, Idolius, and added the species description after he came back. <clears throat> now, I gave you one example of the problems he had with bulbuls. I'll now pick up on bulbuls again, having diverted into drongos, and give you a, another example of the sort of problems that he had. If you look at number 55 here, you'll see it's, um, he put it down in the field as a malacopteron for a bird which is now known as the hook-billed um, bulbul, Saturnus criniger. Now, I have to think hard to make sure I get this right. Um, this is a specimen of the um, hook-billed scimitar that he had sent back to Stevens, and that Stevens had sold on his behalf and had been bought by Lord Tweedale. And Lord Tweedale had, this is in Tweedale's writing, not in Wallace's writing, had overwritten it, well, Viscount Walden, oh, very difficult, Lord Tweedale, he was originally A. Hay, his name was Hay, then he became Lord Walden, then he became, then he became um, Viscount Walden, then he became Lord Tweedale, it's all complicated, never mind. Um, he, um, anyway, he, Walden, or Tweedale, had overwritten 
um, Wallace's label with the identification Saturnus criniger lesson. Now, to show how complicated it had been to actually identify this, Tweedale, or Viscount Walden as he then was clearly, um, had actually written a paper about this clarifying the difference between the na two Saturnus Criniger names that were in the literature, one of which, ironically, had been previously proposed by him. And in doing this work, he drew not only on the Wallace specimen he had um, acquired through Stevens, but he also consulted the other Wallace specimen still held by the Natural History Museum, which I will come to in a moment, and deduced that the bird was the Saturnus criniger that had been described by Lesson, and not, as many had previously presumed, the Saturnus criniger hay. Now, if you then go to the next slide, you'll see during, this is a specimen of the same bird that Wallace had kept for himself. And again, you'll see it's got the overwritten label he came back to it and studied it in the 1860s. And you'll see in the 1860s, um, incidentally, Walden didn't publish his paper until 1872. In the 1860s, when Wallace was identifying it, he actually referred to it as Saturnus Criniger Hay. But then he's crossed that out and scribbled Lesson in, in pencil. He did at least put a question mark after Saturnus Criniger Hay. He's put less on in pencil. That is actually based on Walden's paper, as he makes a reference to that on the back, Walden, Ibis, 1872. And this is quite interesting, because although the intense period in which Wallace was studying and writing up his bird specimens he'd retained, was in the period in the 1860s after his arrival back in 1862 for the next six or seven years. What this shows is that he continued to retain an interest in his bird specimens right as, as late as 1872, which was only just a year before he finally decided to hand over his entire Malay archipelago bird collection to the British Museum. So he was retaining and learning about his specimens through the whole time that he retained his collection. Now, a couple of other examples to illustrate still different points. Here is a page from his species registry, and if you look at number uh, species, the number 81 down at the bottom, you'll see what he originally wrote there was Copsicus. Now, these are magpie robins or shamas, which are a taxonomically pretty complicated group. And, okay, he knew it was some sort of a shama. He didn't know what. A bit later, whether in the field or after he'd come back to Britain, I can't be sure, but probably after he came back to Britain, because he did occasionally still modify. We know he modified this uh, species registry after he was back in Britain, but only occasionally, because in fact, the, the real giveaway is he actually um, notes the name of a bird he didn't describe until 1865, having crossed out the name he'd put down in the field. But anyway, here he's put in uh, the suggestion that it might be Grillivera longicauda, which was an acceptable name for a bird of the Sharma group acceptable name then, that were occurred in Java and Sumatra. So that's where he'd got to in his species registry. When you look at the specimen for number 81, you'll see again, just like in his species registry, he initially just called it Copsicus. Then what he did was add Rufi Venta Wall, but then after that, he's crossed out <coughs> Rufi Venta Wall, well, he's crossed out Rufi Venta, and put in Suavis Sclater. 
Now, what on earth is going on here? Because there is no name Copsicus rupiventa that anywhere in the ornithological literature. What seems to have happened is that when Wallace came back, he immediately started working on his shamas and he, studying them, he decided that his specimen actually must represent a new species. However, what he clearly didn't realize was that in the autumn of 1861, Sclater had written a review of Sharma's uh, in the Proceedings of the Zoological Society in which he had clarified their status and described a new species from Borneo as Copsicus suavis. Now, Wallace didn't become a member of the Zoological Society until 1862 and very likely did not see this paper until after he had decided to assign his own name to it. But once he saw the name in the literature, Suavis Sclater, he obviously crossed his own name out, stuck that in, and indeed um, the Sclater name is still recognized as the name for, in fact, at a subspecies level now, generally, rather than as a species level. So here, Wallace was proposing a new name, but then holding back at the last minute when he consulted the literature and found I've been preempted on this, as I'm sure quite a number of people are familiar with at different times in their careers. Now, just to finish up with, I thought I'd um, stick in um, uh, an example of the, a number of species were named from uh, Wallace's specimens. And the most striking one, perhaps, people may know, is Wallace's hawk eagle, Spizaetus nanus, or nana, um, which was one of the birds he collected while in Sarawak. However, if you look here, notice in particular the species registry entry number nine, which he managed in the field, um, and probably not immediately in the field. This is, I think, probably a somewhat delayed questioning. He's just put warbler query. Here is what he put down as a warbler query. And I would be highly impressed, unless there's anybody here who has spent time in the requisite geographical area, that they were capable of identifying this bird, which is your classic little greeny brown job, which does look singularly warbler-like, but turns out to be Wallace's specimen of the white-bellied Erpornis, which is a bird that has puzzled ornithologists for at least a century after Wallace. For a long, at the time of Wallace, um, if he'd managed to identify it, it was thought to be a babbler. Um, it's now recently been decided that where it really fits is in with the virios. And it's a bird that has a fairly wide distribution through parts of Southeast Asia, but extremely difficult to identify. So no, um, no uh, indignation for Wallace not to have been able to have placed his finger on it very rapidly. However, after... Wallace had presented his specimens to the uh, British Museum, as then was. This particular specimen was used by Sharp to be made the type of uh, the subspecies Brunessens, um, which Sharp designated as being specifically from Borneo and somewhat different from other uh, 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 subspecies of the white-bellied Erpionis elsewhere across its range. And um, you can see here, it may not be that obvious on this label, but originally when this specimen came, probably came back with Wallace, it just had the place, Sarawak, and the number and the date on it. Erpionis danthaluca was identified later. 
He has put that in after he came back to Britain, but later the bird was taken and made the basis for a new subspecies by Sharp, building on um, what he had managed to do himself. So, what can we conclude from all of this? Well, Wallace took pains to equip himself as best he could to identify Asian birds in the field and was impressively successful in this regard. However, his later claim that I could almost always identify every bird already described is clearly an exaggeration for his Sarawak birds. And we must remember Sarawak figured quite early in his time in East Asia. After returning to the UK, Wallace devoted considerable effort to improving on his field identification of many of the specimens he collected. And overall, his Sarawak collection has proved to be scientifically very important. And finally, and probably quite obviously wearing a museum ornithologist's hat, I do feel, and I feel that the work on Wallace shows this, and also previously the work I did on Hume shows this, a comparative analysis of field notebook or diary information and specimen labels can yield a surprising level of insight into the uh, developing identification abilities of the individual in question. Thank you. Um, that was the Asian glossy starness, uh, starling, um, Aplonis uh, panaensis. Yeah. At least we've tracked down seven so far. There may be, maybe there's eight of them, really, or something. But, yeah, that's the one he had most of. Why? I have no idea. Isn't it Philipensis? Uh, 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 it's panaensis. Well, it, uh, it is. I, I've been using uh, for all the... Uh, actually, the acute people in the audience may have puzzled over the bird names, but I've been using Smithies as my reference here, and I've used the names as Smithy gives. Uh, 1999, fourth edition, Birds of Borneo for the modern names. So not quite up to date, but I, th I think it's panaensis. Okay, I, uh, I stand to be corrected on that, and I might have jotted it down incorrectly. I may be wrong. No, I, I may easily be wrong. <laughs> Sorry. <coughs> well, Wallace's own collection, did he keep it all in Sarawak, or did he have somewhere else to send it to? No, no, no. no. He sent everything back to Stevens, but what he did was, and we know from correspondence with this, one of the early shipments, because it was January 1856 when he sent all this stuff back, he made very clear to Stevens what Stevens should um, sell and what he should retain for him. Now, in fact, it, obviously he got a bit fed up describing this all, because Subsequently, Wallace developed a system which is actually very simple but certainly puzzled me when I first looked at his specimens. Quite a lot of his specimens from post-Sarawak days have a red strip across the top of the, um, his label on the specimen. If they have a red strip, they were to be retained for him. If they didn't, they were to be sold. Right. I have a question, Robert. Um, I just Um, I get the, I've not tried to look for this, but I get the impression that the sp most of the specimens that we're aware of where they went to, largely because they subsequently came to the Natural History Museum, were, may not have been sold at auction, but just Stephen sold yes. privately to good clients, and clearly Viscount Walden was a good client. Um, and so it wasn't a specific auction. I, I'm not aware that there was any auction focused, and you have to remember from Sarah, Wallace was sending stuff back from the Malay archipelago at intervals over the eight years. When he sent birds back in January 1856 from Sarawak, he only wanted 60 of his specimens sold. That wouldn't make an auction in itself. Whether any got into an auction, I honestly don't know. So Stevens was acting 
Yes, Stephen, you know, when he was in, uh, famously, when Wallace was in the Amazon, he'd had Stevens as his dealer. And when almost his entire collection sank on the way back home, he had Stevens to thank for having insured it so that he got a bit of a payout when he got home. He was a good bloke, Stevens. No, Samuel Stevens. Not Herbert Stevens. Wrong um, generation, I think. Sorry, that's Steve. That's a very interesting point. I don't know the Irish of all the other more than the other birds, very much of course, to be honest. But you talked about white ashes, and Strongos, and Ironic. It took him eight years to collect these things. Didn't he only collect 90 species? No, 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 no. What was he doing? No, no, no. You've got that wrong. As I thought I'd said at the beginning of the talk, the first place he went to for an extended period and, uh, 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 during his Malay archipelago sojourn was Sarawak and he spent 15 months there. These are birds collected during that 15 months. During that time his massive focus was on insects. His next focus was on orangutans and birds came down the scale and he had a particular problem because his assistant, Charles Allen, was never any good at preparing them. So he didn't collect very many. Thank you for clarifying that. I think I said that, but I stand to be corrected. Do we have any idea how much money Wallace spent on the auction? We do. Uh, um, I can't give you figures off the top of my head. But there is a fair bit of information about this. And um, one or two things have been written about it, in fact. I could point you in the right direction if I go yeah, and... But it was enough to actually oh, uh, contribute rather than just buy the beer or something. Oh, oh, absolutely. Uh, absolutely. In fact, you know, wh the, uh, the stuff he sold w was largely responsible for giving him the ability to spend part of the 1860s writing up the material he retained. Now, throughout his life, Wallace suffered episodic financial problems, partly because of bad investments and things, but certainly his insects, in particular, made him a lot of money. He, you know, when you collect on that scale, yeah, um, yeah and there, most of it was yeah. new. It was a uh, over 1,000 new species were described from um, the insects, I think, from Sarawak alone. You could supplement your income quite considerably. Good. That's, that's <laughs> Sorry, was there someone else? Uh, do, do we know whether Wallace prepared the specimens himself or whether his assistant was actually able to do them? And just following from that, um, uh, uh, what sort of quality of material was he collecting? How accurate? Yeah. Uh, did he know something about how accurate his sexing turned out to be? Right, I, I haven't specifically looked into his sexing. Um, I, that's, that's not a subject I've tried to assess. We, I've looked into it in other contexts, but never in relation to Wallace, so I can't really give you a sensible answer off the top of my head to that. And I think one would probably, in order to get a proper sample size, need to look much wider than Sarawak to get a decent sample size. Um, the, uh, the other part of the question was, sorry. Did he prepare Right. He did. We, we know from throwaway comments that most, many of the bird skins were prepared by him. Um, he, he didn't seem to be able to, he did try to get Charles Allen to do it, but he was never happy with the results. Now, a lot of the skins are actually quite nice. And we do know, for example, uh, they must have been, when he stripped the guts and everything out, probably they were hung up um, by a piece of string, because some t on a couple there's still string through the nostrils. There were, the, the big problem there would have been the humidity causing, obviously, um, uh, mold and everything like that, but also all the carnivorous insects, which, uh, uh, you know, if they possibly could, and rats and things, would eat the bloody specimen. So it, it was quite complicated. First of all, getting the skin prepared and then storing it well enough to await shipment just a bit down the line. Yeah. Robin, I was quite surprised that um, he just designated the location as Sarawak 
Darwin in the morning that he had not been more precise in where he collected things from, especially in right. that part of it. And that he had never been very precise, and he became one of the founders or fathers of biogeography because he was not quite precise in local location and he realized all these physical barriers like rivers to create substitution. Sure. When did he read Darwin and take that message on board? You've got to remember, this was when he went to uh, Sarawak. This was 1854-1855. Now, possibly, Darwin himself, of course, came to have a big problem with the fact that, for example, with the Galapagos finches, he hadn't properly noted what islands. And he had to go to uh, Fitzroy, Captain Fitzroy, who's often derided nowadays, who had actually labelled his own specimens correctly. Um, and I, I think if you look at a lot of the collectors from about this time, they do tend to give slightly generalised labels. And you have to remember with Wallace, he was only working in the western end of Sarawak. He, he didn't give the detail. He may have read something uh, by Darwin, but possibly not until after he was in Sarawak. You remember, The Origin of Species was published 1859. Um, I, I, yeah, I can't tell you more than that. I was just going to ask, there's, there's no way of um, retrospectively working out the more um, precise localities. Well, all you've got to go on is the fact that, as I said, the first 23 numbers in his species registry are represented by at least one specimen from 1854. We do know roughly the area he was in in 1854. The birds labelled 1855, that area I showed you in, I think, in slide three, they could essentially, the specimens, be taken anywhere within that area depending on the uh, you know, the, uh, the, the precise date. Did he keep diaries? I don't know. Um, I am not aware of any precise diary other than his species registry listing in any systematic way when he collected specific bird specimens. We have to live with the fact that for place, he just gave Sarawak, and for date, he just gave year. So you can make a few inferences, but not get very far. Do we know how far he travelled? Well, I did show... Uh, yeah, he, what he did, he was very largely around a couple of centres, um, Kuching and I think it's called Simenjang, where a coal mine was being set up. He did a lot of collecting around those areas. But then he did, towards the end of his time in Sarawak, make a big three-month trip up the Sadong River, across the sort of watershed, and then back down the Sarawak River, so we know the area he encompassed pretty well during his time in Sarawak, but not well enough to pin any specimen with confidence down to a particular area. The, the reason I ask Except for possibly the 1854 ones. All of the specimens you showed are actually quite widespread Asian yeah. species. I don't, don't think there was a single born in endemic. Uh, m there may well not have been, yeah. Well, Wallace himself said that he was struck by, in the areas he was in, firstly, he recognized he had made very poor efforts in context of bird collecting because of uh, the work he had to put in elsewhere and because of the limitations of Allen. But he was also disappointed, he said, in the avifauna he encountered in the area he was in, which is interesting in retrospect, and one wonders why that might be, because it clearly is quite rich. Yeah, and then there would have been a, a decent amount of, of habitat available then. Yeah. Um, lowland habitat, yeah. because clearly it's mostly lowland species. Yeah. Yeah, well, he only spent, a, you know, when he was moving between the, the, the upper waters of the two rivers, I think was the only time he spent at all high up. Most of the endemics are montane anyway. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, I, I, I don't know. But he didn't, as I tried to say at the beginning, the effort he put in on birds was not equivalent to the huge effort he put in on insects and the, the focus he ended up making on orangutans, which were of huge interest and very valuable commercially. Just out of interest, have you looked at his entomological specimens? Are they more 
I, I'm afraid not. It, 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 once you get up to totals like 25,000, it becomes intimidating. In beetles were his particular speciality. He also collected Lepidoptera in considerable quantities. No, no I have not. I, I think that is, as we would say, a step too far. <laughs>